Nervous? Yes. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. In this video, we're going to talk about simplifying exponents and radical expressions. Um, so let's get started right away with exponents and begin by talking about uh, the definition and what exactly an exponent is. Um, so an exponent is basically just notation for repeated multiplication of a given base number. Well, that's a very complicated way of saying that if I'm multiplying the same thing a whole bunch of times, like 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, rather than writing out this whole expression, I can simplify it by simply writing this as the base number, 3, which is the number that's getting repeatedly multiplied, to the exponent, which goes up here, which tells me how many of these threes I'm multiplying. Uh, it's similar if you have uh, variables, you can use the same notation, but all it is is a repeated multiplication. Now, as you've seen in previous math classes, there are lots of properties associated with these exponents, and in your textbook on page 12, you can see a list of all of the properties you should already be familiar with. So it's on page 12. Uh, don't worry about property three right now. We'll talk about that later in the course. Um, but let's go through these properties just so that you can uh, be familiar with them um, for tomorrow. So start off with property one. If I have exponents of the same base, so in this case, my base is x, I can rewrite this as the sum of the two exponents. So this whole thing is really just x to the seventh. And if you're wondering why, well, think about um, what the exponent means again. So this first exponent, x squared, is really just x times x by definition. That's what an exponent means, repeated multiplication of multiplying this base twice. Then again, multiplied by this x to the fifth, which is x times x times x times x times x times x, five times. So altogether, I have seven values of x, which is why it ends up being x to the seventh. So all of these exponent properties can be proven by simply um, using the definition of exponent. So now going through here, um, if I have a base raised to a particular exponent divided by a base raised to a particular exponent, I can simplify this quickly using the property that I can subtract these two exponents from each other, and it ends up just being x. It's an ugly looking x, but there it is. So the third, 7 minus 4. Another property is that any base raised to an exponent of 0 is telling me that I'm multiplying 5 by itself 0 times, or there are 0 factors of 5 showing up in this number. Well, if there's no factors of 5, I'm left with just the number 1, because this is really 1 times 5 to the 0, so I have just 1. Any base raised to the 0 power is 1, so if, even if it's a variable, so if I had y to the 0 power, that would also still be 1. Now, looking at the other ones, exponents, because it's representing repeated multiplication, can distribute across multiplication, so this 3 will be applied to both of these. This is really 5 to the 3rd times x to the 3rd, and since 5 to the 3rd is a number value, I should expand that. 5 times 5 is 25, times 5 is 125. So 5 cubed is 125, x to the 3rd. In here, uh, since there's only one term, I'm not distributing it to anything. But when I raise exponents to exponents, I can multiply them. So this is y to the 2nd times 5, which would be y to the 10th. Okay. And again, that can be demonstrated with uh, the definition of exponent. I have two factors of 5 here, and then those two factors are repeated 5 times. So 2 times 5 would be 10, so that's why I have 10 factors of y. And then in here, not only do exponents distribute across multiplication, but they also distribute across addition. So this exponent will be applied to both the numerator and denominator, and I end up with 5 squared over 3 squared, or more simply, 25 ninths. Okay, well, now when you're simplifying exponents on your own, the properties won't be used in isolation like they are here. You'll have an expression that looks more like this, and you have to decide which property to use when. So if I'm looking at this expression, and I want to simplify it, 
um, general rule of thumb is to start from the outside in. And I'm also going to look at, since I have two sets of parentheses, I'm going to look at them in two separate parts. So first I'm going to simplify this part, then I'll simplify the second part, and then I'll multiply them together, because there's an understood multiplication between these two parentheses. Well, from the outside in, I have this 2, and since it's being applied to all of these things, I have to distribute it across this multiplication, and to the b, so I have negative 3 quantity squared, a, squared, and I have b to the fourth squared, and using my multiplication property, property 6, that'll give me b to the eighth, 4 times 2. Okay, now let's look at the second part here. Again, I have a 3 on the outside, so I'm going to distribute that to every individual term that's being multiplied, every factor. So I have 4 to the third power, well, 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 times 4 is 64. Then I have a squared to the third power. Well, a squared to the third power, using that exponents raised to exponents property, 6, be 2 times 3, or 6, this is a to the 6th, divided by b to the third power. Okay? So now that I've simplified each part individually, it's this whole stuff times this whole stuff. Now since it's a fraction, this will end up in the denominator. Uh, also I should square my negative 3, so negative 3 squared will give me 9. And then I have a squared b to the eighth, okay, times 64 a to the sixth, so this will be times 64 a to the sixth, divided by b cubed, multiplying fractions. Recall when you're multiplying fractions, it's numerator times numerator and denominator times denominator. And since this section has no denominator, it's understood to be 1. So 1 times b cubed gives me b cubed in the denominator, and all this stuff in the numerator stays there. So now let's simplify some things. First, I'm going to have to do 9 times 64. Using my handy-dandy calculator, I can take that out, make sure it's on, clear whatever's in there. And I'm going to do 9 times 64, so 9 times 64 is 576. So 576. Then I have an a squared here, and I have an a to the sixth here. So using my property one, whenever I have two things of the same base multiplied together, I can add their exponents. So looking here, a squared times a to the sixth will give me a to the eighth. Oops, I undo that. So that's a to the eighth. Okay, so I got my number's taken care of, I got my a's taken care of, and now I have b to the eighth divided by b cubed, and using my property 2, I can subtract those exponents. So I have 8 minus 3 will be 5, so this will be times b to the fifth power. Okay? So that's how I would use my properties and simplify. We'll go over more examples of these tomorrow. Now, with exponents, also radicals. Radicals! Yeah! <laughs> now, radicals you've probably seen before, uh, square roots. For example, if I'm taking the square root of 25, if I want to simplify this, um, I'm going to look for perfect squares within that. And since 25 is 5 times 5, the square root of that, or the number when multiplied um, to a pack, uh, by itself, gives me 25 would be 5. Now, something you probably haven't seen before is basically a cube root, which is the same kind of thing, except now I'm going to add a little thing called the an index to this radical. It's a little 3 here, and rather than looking for a perfect square, I'll be looking for perfect cubes. So for example, since 8 is 2 times 2 times 2, there's three factors of 2 in 8, the cube root of 8 will be 2. Similarly, if I'm looking for the cube root of, let's say, 125. Well, 125 is 5 times 5 times 5, so this cube root will give me back 5. If we extend 
this definition a little bit more, we can come up with what's called the nth principal root, which looks something like this, in which this n represents the index of the root and this a, the radicand. Well, what does that mean to me? Well, it means that I can basically take a root of any number, particularly, for example, if I want the fifth principal root of the number, uh, I don't know, let's say 32. Well, since 2 multiplied with itself a total of 5 times will give me 32, the fifth principal root of 32 would be the number 2. It's the number when multiplied by itself, the number of the index would give you back the radicand. So, using this in practice, just like we had all these properties for simplifying exponents, we all have all these properties for simplifying radicals, and here's a couple of examples for when you're simplifying roots. Also, these properties can be found on page 16 of your textbook for further examples. I'm going to go through a couple of examples here, and then we'll look at more tomorrow. First off, if I'm simplifying this, it's a basic square root, something you've seen before. I'm looking for perfect squares that are in here. Now, unfortunately, 75 is not a perfect square. But if you notice, 3 times 25 would give me 75, and 25 is a perfect square. I'm going to be able to pull this perfect square out. So I'll have 5, which is the square root of 25 that I'm able to pull out of this radical, and I'm left with a 3, which is not a perfect square, still in the radical. So I'm looking for perfect square factors that I can break out. Now, um, if you're curious what property I'm using of radicals here, I'm basically taking the fact that uh, 3 times 25 is 75, so the square root of 75 is equal to the square root of 3 times 25, and then I'm using that radical property that the product of individual radicals is equal to the radical of the product, which results in the square root of 3 times 5, which is just 5 rad 3. So I'm using this string of properties, I'm not necessarily writing it out every time I do the simplification, but this is the process I'm going through. I'm breaking out perfect squares. I'm basically using these radical properties to simplify it. I could repeat this exact same process with the x component. The perfect square that's in there, I have x times x squared, okay, because I have x squared times x to the first would give me x cubed. This part is a perfect square, so I'm able to take out the x squared would reduce to a single x, and I'm left with this x still inside my radical. And again, if you want to see that written out, that would be the square root of x cubed is equal to the square root of x squared times x, right? Because x squared times x would give me x cubed, which is equal to the square root of x squared times the square root, my pen's giving me some trouble, square root of x, which would be be x rad x, which is where this two components of x came from. Now, when you're simplifying radicals, if you feel comfortable writing it out in this long process every single time, that's fine. Uh, for speed, I use this notation so I can keep track of what I'm breaking off, and then I have my final simplified answer here. So my number component simplified to 5 rad 3, my uh, variable component simplified to x rad x, and put all together, that's 5x square root of 3x. Now I'm just going to clear some of this out. Superfluous work. And let's look at some of these cube roots, cube roots which you've seen less of. Now, just like with square roots, I should also point out when there's no index here, it's assumed to be a square root or an index of 2. But with cube roots, like I did with square roots, in square roots I found perfect squares, in cube roots I'm going to find perfect cubes. So in 24, I know this is 3 times 8, and 8 is a perfect cube. So this will be equal to the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 3 using those radical properties, and the cube root of 8 simplifies to just 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So this will be 2 cube root of 3, simplified. 
Now we're going to get a little bit more complicated with these cube roots by throwing in a variable. Same exact process. Um, just like I did with the square roots up here, I'm going to look first at the numbers and then at the variables. So my number values would be 8 is the perfect cube I see in here, and 2. So when I'm simplifying this, the cube root of 8 will come out of this radical as a 2, and remaining inside that cube root, because it's not a perfect cube, is this 2. So I'm not able to pull that out. And then when I repeat this process with the variable, I can write that as a cubed times a. a cubed is a perfect cube, so I'm able to pull that out of the radical. And I'm left with this a still inside that radical. So I have 2a cube root of 2a. That's my final answer. We'll look more at these radicals tomorrow and exponents in simplifying using these properties.